before we get started today, um, as you all are aware, we're here to discuss our Rebuild the Rock sales tax initiative to have a briefing. Uh, but we first want to start um, to correct some wrong information that's been shared by a news outlet as it relates to um, our city's mass mandate. We want to ensure, number one, the reason why we have it. Um, and first and foremost, just from a personal standpoint, we clearly know there are individuals that may not want to continue to do it. Uh, we're in the middle of two different uh, faiths right now, uh, whether it's the Hindu community uh, being their holy uh, time uh, or the Christian community being holy week. And one of the main things, whether it's the triumph of good versus evil, uh, is loving thy neighbor. And this is one of the best way uh, for the residents to love thy neighbor uh, by completing these coverings uh, around our face to protect our community. Uh, we know that this is something that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're not there yet, but we see it, and we want to continue to move forward. Uh, and every 30 days, uh, we hope it's not too many 30-day time periods, um, but for the next 30 days, we'll be watching and then discuss the reevaluation at the end of that. But again, there was some misinformation, some wrong information. Uh, that was shared earlier today. Uh, we want to ensure that there's always accurate information shared in regards to the mass mandate and the City of Little Rock's authority uh, through our state of city emergency as well as um, those different um, positions with it. We have here with us today Alex Bedden, who is our Chief Deputy City Attorney, uh, who will go through that timeline. Mr. Bedden. Good afternoon. As the mayor said, my name is Alex Bedden. I'm the chief deputy city attorney for this great city. Uh, we uh, draft the legislation um, that puts these mandates into effect. Uh, the declaration of local disaster and emergency, when issued, lasts for 120 days. We first issued on, on March 26th of last year. It was numbered 20-01. It expired, <clears throat> excuse me, on July 24th of 2020, but on June 25th of 2020, that declaration was amended to add face covering. We then reissued another declaration of local disaster emergency on August 21st of 2020. It had no real significant changes, and it expired on December 29th of 2020. However, on that date, we issued 20-08, uh, and that declaration will expire on April 28th of this year. However, the one issued today, 21-01, amends that one to address face covering. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bedden. Um, our authority relies because when you understand when you're in a state of a city emergency, you generally have 120 days under that emergency. And um, if it expires, um, you do not need necessarily a city board authority. But if you have to continue it on the 121st day, uh, that's when you do require a city board authority. And so when there's times of periods of lapse based on the law and then you reissue it, you still remain an authority. Hence what Mr. Bedden just shared. And we want to make sure that, that we correct the record uh, for some of the news outlet, the news outlet that shared that uh, misinformation. But we're here today to discuss the Rebuild the Rock sales tax initiative. As we talked about this past Thursday uh, with our Rebuild the Rock uh, proposal along with our State of the City address, we talked about rebuilding the rock. What we've all experienced as we have pursued and persevered and pushed through the pandemic. Uh, we know the great things of in the middle of the pandemic, we've announced close to 4,000 new jobs. We expect to double that by the end of this year. Uh, but we want to talk today about the future. As we're coming out of the pandemic, we must focus on our city's future and how we invest in our city's potential. And that's truly where you come to a period in time that we want to be better than our beginnings. We want to be better than March 11th, 2020, a day before we announced our state of the city emergency here in the city of Little Rock. We want to ensure that every resident irrespective of race, religion, culture, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, has a future and a present right here in our city. 
And the best way to focus in on rebuilding the rock is focusing on quality of life in place, amenities, focusing on public safety, infrastructure, early childhood education, affordable housing, and understanding that the new economic development model focuses on quality, quality of life and place. So I want to take time to walk through uh, the why. That was the why. But now take time to walk through how do we fund this. We understand that the Re Rebuild the Rock initiative is just one penny. Technically, it's 0.625%. Uh, and so we moved from 9% to 9.625%. And what we can do with this penny that will accrue somewhere around $53 million a year permanently to invest in our city. And we understand that these capital projects and these ongoing services will do the best for our future. And so today I want to walk through some of these great initiatives as we talk through the, how, the why and now the how. There we go. Oh, there we go. So when we look through this, three eight cents, uh, one, we want to make sure everyone is clear uh, from the standpoint that our 38 cent sales tax expires December 31st, 2021. And so that makes it to a point that if we do pass the sales tax of a penny, there's really 58 cents, which will take it to the 9.625%. And so right now in the city of Little Rock, our percent rate is 9%. It'll go to 9.625% if we pass this soon this summer. As you see from this particular side, many times we want to benchmark ourselves against other reputable cities that are across our region. You see right now the city of Little Rock is 9%, Baton Rouge is 9.95%, Birmingham is 10%, Chattanooga is 9.25%, St. Louis 9.64%, and 10.25%. And so with this moderate increase, of $53 million based on this one penny gets us still below most cities in our region. One of the things we want to continue to emphasize is that we understand in this administration we will always be accountable, clear, and transparent. And so we understand this is an infusion of dollars, $53 million, and we want to continue to have a citizen-led commission that will focus on how we can be accountable, clear, and transparent with the dollars that are our city's dollars, our residents' dollars for true um, stewardship. This commission will report and review quarterly uh, the project updates because there'll be a lot of dollars out there, a lot of construction projects, potential bond refinancing, public-private partnerships. When you think about War Memorial Park being our central park, Hyman Park being a mountain bike destination, you think about the city of Little Rock finally having its own senior center as well as its own youth sports complex. We want to ensure that the dollars are spent wisely and spent well and that we always maintain our word. And so we'll be given different uh, recommendations each 10 years. And so through this citizen-led committee, they will be managing that process with us. There will also be a re reallocation resolution that will show, based on percentages, what the dollars amounts will always be dedicated to. So right now, if you look through the numbers, 34% of the $53 million will go towards quality life in place amenities. And so that will be in the resolution to ensure that no matter what happens, those dollars, that percentage amount will be spent. So here we have today, um, as we look through the various amounts of projects, and much of this I can go through memory. So think about it right now. When you are a resident, sometimes you go to other cities. You may go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Oklahoma City, or you go to Charlotte, and you come back from a vacation saying, wow, I wish we had this in Little Rock. Whether it's the gathering place in Tulsa, whether it's the uh, the Scissor Park in Oklahoma City, whether it's Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Central Park in New York, you always come back wishing we had some type of quality and life in place amenities. And so what we can do now with this $30 million in the first 10 years of what we do to invest with War Memorial Park, think about it right now. Having a youth sports complex where the city of Little Rock can be a regional destination for AAU sports. Think about it right now, connecting the Southwest Trail from Hot Springs, Arkansas, through War Memorial Park and Hyman Park. We understand right now with all the dollars and investments that we're making with uh, our, both our public and private partners, because we understand that cycling is the new destination. And the investments that we're making now in Pinnacle State Mountain Park, Two Rivers Park, and River Mountain, that we can have this in Southwest Little Rock at Hyman Park. 
And so there you see about $30 million that will be uh, funded through that in the first 10 years. But also we understand that our city truly is a city in a park. And understand that our city is truly a city in a park. We have 63 parks right now that have not been funded appropriately for at least as long as I've been alive, which is not that long. And so when you understand that standpoint is that it's time to increase the maintenance of our parks. So when you think about bringing courts back to Canis Park by I-630, you think about making improvements to Interstate Park, the improvements that we're going to have at Ripsonman Park. And as we talk through that, you'll start to see now the expansion of golf operations at First Tee. First Tee will now move from a nine-hole course to 18 holes. Rebsman will now have more soccer. There will also be a tennis academy at Rebsman Park. There will now be a youth sports complex at West Central, where we know there are areas where our youth, to reach their true potential, we must maintain activities for each of them, no matter where you live in our city. But moving from that, we also want to take time now. Another great uh, quality of life and place amenity in many cities is at Zoo. And so we're going to now have Susan Altrui, our zoo director, to kind of speak through that. Susan? Well, thank you, Mayor Scott. And I certainly am pleased to be here to talk about the Little Rock Zoo, which is one of Arkansas's greatest attractions and certainly one of Little Rock's greatest attractions. I want to talk to you about opportunity because that's what this ballot initiative brings to Little Rock, and it's what it brings to the Little Rock Zoo. The Little Rock Zoo is a place for conservation learning. It's a place for family recreation. It's a place that when you're in Little Rock, you say, let's go to the zoo. But we want our zoo to be a place that people say, we want to go to Little Rock to go to the zoo. And that's the opportunity that this ballot initiative brings. It makes our zoo a true destination. What we have in this ballot initiative are things that we have really done a lot of great research on. And one of the things that I think is really great about some of the research we've done is that we asked kids. In 19, well, to, excuse me, 2019, I don't want to go back too far there, the 1900s, but in 2019, at the end of 2019, beginning of, the, of 2000, uh, we asked kids, what do you want to see done to your Little Rock Zoo at a kids task force? And they said, we want to see more interaction. We want to be able to interact with the animals. And we want to be able to get a little bit more up close with those animals too. And we really want to make sure that all of our animals at the Little Rock Zoo are as happy as possible. We want happy animals. Well, of course our animals are happy, and we can make sure that that's being done great. But how do we provide more interaction for those animals? And one thing that we always hear from our public is that they want to see giraffes back at the Little Rock Zoo. And so I'm very proud to announce that we're going to be able to bring giraffes back with an interactive giraffe habitat with this ballot initiative. That's one of the greatest things that we can do through this is have that interactive experience through giraffe feeding. It's something that you can get in Memphis at the Memphis Zoo. It's something you can get at the Tulsa Zoo and at the St. Louis Zoo. But it's something that we need to have here at the Little Rock Zoo. And that giraffe experience will also include opportunities for other revenue generating things, for special event activities, and also it will renovate another large portion of the zoo. Also included in this is the opportunity for a North American habitat to include something like the red wolf, which is a native species that used to roam all around these parts. And of course, we're not going to leave out those razorbacks. We're going to bring razorbacks back to the Little Rock Zoo. Those two incredible things will renovate a large portion of our zoo, and that will be fantastic for our zoo. In addition to that, we have additional funding for operations. And what's great about that, the Little Rock Cent, which was passed in 2011, provided a lot of very important funding for our zoo. It helped us to renovate and to keep our accreditation, a very important thing. Having accreditation, we are the only accredited zoo from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, but having that important funding for operations allows us to maintain that accreditation. 
So by passing this ballot initiative, you will help us to shore up that accreditation, maintain that excellent a standard, and make sure that we have the very best here in Little Rock, because Little Rock is the very best. We are the capital city. We want to maintain the very best right here in Little Rock. And I hope that you will join me in supporting the Little Rock Zoo and supporting our capital city by supporting this ballot initiative. Thank you, Susan. We'll continue to move forward. Um, the second most funded uh, portion of this project uh, is our public safety. Um, I think anyone that understands the City of Little Rock's budget understands that close to 56% of our general fund is funded towards our Little Rock Police Department, uh, which is around $80 million, uh, as well as in addition to the Little Rock Fire Department. Uh, so truly we show a priority towards public safety in our general fund, but we wanted to show that same priority towards public safety in the sales tax. And so when we look, when, when I talk through these millions of dollars, think because it is not being sunset, it's the first 10 years. So in the first 10 years, we'll be spending $63 million towards public safety. And what that includes, if you look at that on an annual basis, that's $6.3 million a year. And part of that process is to fund a West Little Rock fire station to reduce the response time in West Little Rock because we know how much uh, West Little Rock is growing. But also, as it relates to the Little Rock Police Department, we'll be investing in public safety technology and operations so we can truly focus on 21st century community policing to have more community policing officers as well as technology from that standpoint, as well as more vehicle replacement both for the Little Rock Police Department and the Little Rock Fire Department. So this demonstrates again where in our general fund, we're spending close to 56% of a $280 million budget towards public safety, that we're going to be making more investments into public safety in this sales tax initiative to truly honor and understand 21st century community policing. But moving from that, because that's out of that $53 million, we're talking about 12% uh, that will go towards public safety in addition to the 56% that we spend towards it uh, in our general fund. Uh, but another highlight of this organization is we always have to continue to take care of our infrastructure. Infrastructure truly is the foundation of economic development. How are we taking care of our roads, our drainage, and flooding here in our city? And so we will be spending in the first 10 years $50 million, which is $5 million annually, split between street resurfacing, neighborhood streets, and sidewalks that we will allot somewhere around $3 million, but also another $2 million annually towards strategic infrastructure improvement areas for those areas that have been unserved, overlooked, and strategic. So if you're in the Hillcrest and the Heights area, we're going to be focusing on drainage improvements. If you're in Southwest Little Rock area, we're going to be focusing on, uh, with those strategic improvements, focusing on flooding. If you're in West Little Rock, we're going to be focusing on finally trying to make a dent at, you know, expanding Bowman and Canis Road. Uh, and so those are the type of things that will be allotted for this fit first $50 million, which is $5 million annually. But moving from infrastructure, it's all about economic development. As we shared earlier, uh, this city has experienced under our administration historic year-over-year -year jobs growth. 4,000 announced jobs here in our city, whether it's the Trader Joe's, the Amazon Southwest Little Rock off of I-30, the Amazon that's going to be open at Little Rock Port, 3.5 square million feet right here in our city, Costco, what have you. All of those new jobs that we're bringing, we got to continue to feed the opportunity for more opportunities, economic opportunities right in our city. So we have allotted in the first 10 years $41 million, which is $4.1 million annually. But one of the things we want to focus on, just as much passion and desire that we have in bringing companies to our city, we want to honor our small businesses and our local businesses that are expanding right now in our city. We take a company like Priority One Logistics that are keeping their headquarters here, homegrown company, expanding it with 100 new people. We want to ensure that if a small business or a local company needs that opportunity, that it justifies from an economic and job creation standpoint point, we want to be helpful just like we're helpful in bringing other companies to our city. So we've allotted a small business and local fund of about a million dollars specifically for that. But also in addition to that is three million dollars annually to focus on job creation from a port expansion standpoint, infrastructure improvements, incubator space, those type of things on how we continue to bring more jobs here. Because we are the job city in the state capital city and we're grateful for that. Uh, but moving from that, uh, 
we want to take some time now to have our Chief Education Officer, Dr. Jay Barth, come. We all know the great work that he's been doing in focusing on community schools, which is a national model that we're bringing to our state, where we're focusing on the most at-risk students at the most at-risk schools within the Little Rock School District, from as simple as focusing on addressing food insecurities to as complex as focusing on mental health and social services. And this is moving the needle to take care of our most vulnerable and our most precious assets, our children and our youth. And Dr. Jay Barth is now going to be speaking to why we are choosing the why to focus on early childhood education, specifically in the area of zero to two. Dr. Barth. Thanks, Mayor. Hi, everyone. Um, there are a few public investments that have the return on investment uh, that early childhood education has. Conservative investments of the return on investment are about 10 to 1. That for every dollar invested in public education, we as a society, we as a community, we, we have $10 uh, in return. And that is why uh, we are making this investment, uh, proposing to make this investment in early childhood education. We know the best return on investment is within the earliest ages. The earlier we start with high quality early childhood education, the bigger the payoff over the long haul. And while our state officials have over the last uh, couple of decades really paid careful attention to four-year-olds, those folks just, those kids just getting ready to start school, we know that we've got some real challenges when it comes to our youngest learners, those infants, those toddlers, and some three-year-olds who are uh, not getting the early childhood opportunities that they need. And so this proposal, which would provide $4.5 million a year to early childhood education in Little Rock, really does try to do two big things. First, we provide more access for more students, especially those infants and toddlers. And we do it not by creating a whole new program, but instead by partnering with state agencies in the work that they do. And instead using their administrative um, structures, but putting city money towards uh, children who, will, who are in Little Rock. And so that will be very important uh, at the zero to two range and then also for uh, working poor families uh, who, of, uh, of three-year-olds. The other thing that this model tries to do is grow the number of slots, the number of high quality early childhood slots, both by providing technical assistance and job training to, um, to private providers and just as, um, as the mayor mentioned uh, about small businesses, these are some of the most important small businesses, many of which are women-led, and we need to make that investment in these, uh, in these private providers. We also, of course, know that some of the best providers in the city are in the Little Rock School District, and this would also uh, create some expansion of opportunity there uh, as well. And so we know that this will have payoff over the long haul. It's a proven, uh, a proven uh, set of programs, um, and as the mayor said, for community schools to really thrive and be their best, we need children to arrive at those schools uh, already ready to learn, and this program presents that opportunity. There's another component to this, uh, this package, though, that ties back to early childhood, and that is making an investment in children early in their lives for their college and career training later on. And so the a college savings account, specifically a 529 program, is a perfect way of sending a strong signal that we are going to make a small investment early in a child's life, specifically when they leave kindergarten and then uh, divided uh, with some money that they will get when they leave fifth grade, that will go into an account that they can then use later in their lives for the expenses that come with college and career training. And this is important because it sends a really strong signal, and the, the research is very clear. This begins to change the mindset of families about what their children's futures are going to be. That it's not the question of whether they will go to college, but really what program is best for them. This will be uh, harnessed with uh, some excellent financial literacy education so that we can really build a culture of savings uh, in all our families that has tremendous economic payoff for our community. So I think this investment of $4.5 million a year can really make the city of Little Rock uh, stand out, a distinctive force in the Mid-South as a place where we are committed uh, to our children uh, in the most vulnerable years of their lives. 
Mayor? As we get ready to come to a close uh, and transition uh, to offer some questions, I kind of want to bring this all together. Uh, this is about our city being big, uh, being bold, and brave as we see our way out of the pandemic to ensure that we be better than our beginnings. Uh, that's the reason why we're choosing to seek uh, and ask uh, Little Rock residents to invest in itself, to invest in our potential, to ensure that we focus on uniting our city and focusing on true growth so we can transform. Uh, because we are a catalyst to the New South. We are one of 50 other unique cities, a state capital city. We are a city with swagger, but the same city that has swagger has to invest in itself each and every day and by choosing to invest in our city to ensure that we have any and every amenity that our residents desire within fiscal stewardship, to ensure that we understand that our city is a city that's now engaging in an opportunity that workforce is changing that the economy is changing, that we understand the trends, and this sets us to promote ourselves out of the pandemic quicker than ever by focusing on quality life in place, by focusing on public safety and infrastructure, by ensuring that we garner more residents to increase our 200,000 population to more by investing in early childhood education so we can have more families choosing to live in our city and preparing their youth for the future. To understand that a part of this process is uh, that we have to continue to address affordable housing and how affordable housing is a focus with homelessness for our brothers and sisters experiencing homelessness and how we have set aside $20 million in the first 10 years to acquire and rehab single family units, to go into neighborhoods where we see dilapidated homes to reinvigorate our neighborhoods to ensure that we foster a greater future. That is the reason we're making that while we are making these investments. So we can be big, we can be bold, and we can be brave and demonstrate how and why we are the state's capital city by investing in our potential and our future. And as I transition, uh, one of the things, uh, we've now been in office two years. Uh, many know that part of that process, we had a transition period. Uh, we had a transition report called the Scott Script. And one of the many tenets, and if you look at any public policy that we've pursued and achieved, it can all go back to our Scott Script. We literally are acting from that script. It's no surprise on the things that we are pursuing. And so one of those things is we had this citizen-led transition uh, Dr. Barth was part of that transition as well, that members wanted to see their mayor in the neighborhoods to talk and have different Q&A questions outside of the traditional neighborhood association meetings. And so today we'll be announcing our Scott Strolls that we'll be going, starting April the 7th at 6 p.m., we'll be going to the Petaway and South on Main association areas where we will be going and connecting with our residents sharing not only about the rebuild the rock campaign but also talking about everyday issues and these are issues that for every resident isn't able to go to a neighborhood association meeting but many residents don't get a chance to see their mayor in their neighborhoods outside of an election year and this is the reason why because we want to continue to connect with our residents to get real understanding of what they want, how they want it, and how we can always do a better job because we work for our residents. So we'll be starting this on April the 7th at 6 p.m. We're very excited about it. Again, it's time, and quite frankly, it's past time to rebuild the rock. We'll now have the floor for any questions. A little more detail in terms of the 21st century community policing. What kind of things could LRP Sure, and the 63.7 million in the first 10 years, which is about 6.3 million annually, uh, part of that process you will see in the 21st Century Community Policing, we have a new division, a 21st Century Community Policing Division that's being managed by Major Casey Clark. And so what you can see is more uh, of our community uh, resource officers in the neighborhoods. Uh, a greater presence, but a presence from a standpoint of working with the community to understand what's going on in the community so we can always continue to do a better job of preventing crime uh, before crime happens. We have a great closure rate, meaning that when crime happens, we close that rate within um, 
by 80%, but we want to stop crime before it ever happens as well. And then also is marrying not only having community resource officers from this standpoint, but also focusing on the technology to ensure that we're always going to be smart on crime as well. Well, we, we presented uh, much like what we're doing today, uh, last night to the city board, all of the details. Clearly, we want time for the city board to digest. Uh, it is $53 million. Uh, it is something that's going to uh, transform our city. Uh, much like when you think about cities like Atlanta, you think about cities like Charlotte, you think about cities like Austin, they all have pivotal points in Oklahoma City uh, where leadership took calculated risks to forward the future. And so you look at Oklahoma City, they had a MAPS program. You think about Atlanta, they had Marta and Hartsfield-Jackson that catapulted their city from an economic development standpoint and a quality of life in place. This is our generation's opportunity to unite, grow, and transform Little Rock together. And I'm so very excited about that. So that being said, to answer your question, uh, we've shared the details with the members of the board. We'll continue to meet with them. It's our plan to give them an ordinance as soon as possible uh, to call for a summer election. Mayor, in terms of proposals for projects within those additional 10-year periods, how much of that would involve community proposals and initiatives versus just board decisions? Well, everything is a community initiative because uh, the men and women of Little Rock uh, City Board are elected by our, our community members. And so what generally happens while we have the citizen-led commission, uh, that citizen-led commission will help uh, determine and look after different projects that, that we do in the second 10 years. Clearly, this is the first 10 years. Uh, but we are paying attention when you talk about the zoo and early childhood education. Much of this uh, we've already heard around the city in different community groups and focus groups. And so that's how we were able to uh, provide the details that you have today. And so uh, the main point in having a citizen-led commission is to ensure that we are accountable, clear, and transparent with those dollars, that everything that we are talking about now is paid for, completed, and when it's paid for and completed because it's a 10-year cycle, that the new projects will hear from the community and the mayor, uh, myself, uh, and the chief administrative officer will then bring forth new projects for the board to discuss and, and vote on. Yes, I mean, no one uh, would have expected since we've been in office that we experienced a 500-year flood, experienced a global pandemic, uh, and many other things. Uh, so we're bracing ourselves, or even a historic snowstorm. So we're bracing ourselves for any and everything. Uh, but it's time to pursue this. Uh, we know things can happen, uh, but we know that uh, we can't take, uh, cannot take advantage of this opportunity. We clearly had to focus on a global pandemic uh, when we decided to suspend back on March 12th. Um, but we see our way out of this pandemic. And again, that's another reason why we keep our mask mandate to ensure that we, can, we don't have to go back to a, a modified shelter in place uh, arena. And so we want to prepare for our future. Um, the nature of sales tax is that it lands hardest on low income people. And I'm just wondering if that's a concern at all. I know the city's hands are tied to some extent with regard to revenue, and a sales tax is perhaps the major way to raise revenue from the city's point of view. But is that a concern at all for the low-income um, neighbors here for whom this is going to take a small but perhaps significant bite out of there? It's always a concern. Um, we understand that sales tax can be considered a regressive tax, uh, but there are only so many tools that the city of Little Rock has. Um, uh, and so this is the, from a fiscal stewardship standpoint, this is the best way to truly invest in our city. So we can ensure that we increase the per capita income. When you see about the investments that we're making, it hits every grand scale of every resident, whether you're low income, moderately income, or high income, because we're choosing to invest in our youth with our early childhood education that clearly changes the trajectory of someone's wealth. We're also focusing on affordable housing, which is tied directly to closing the wealth gap, to focusing on infrastructure that's clearly uh, the foundation for economic development and bringing more jobs. That is our goal to increase the per capita income of the entire residency. One last question. Mayor, let's say, when it's all said and done, let's say, uh, you know, or, you know, says yes, this way after summer election and it gets passed. Are you hoping that Little Rock and that Arkansas see the bigger picture and not just that it's a one cent uh, sales tax? Yes, we believe that the residents 
um, have been yearning uh, for this type of investment. Uh, the residents have been yearning to do more in their home. Uh, and by this goal, we will choose to invest in ourselves. We'll be bold, we'll be brave, and we'll continue to be big. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh,